Will somebody out here? Oh, hello, folks. <laughs> okay, good evening. I'm Judy Whips from Grand Valley, and I'm here to introduce both this lecture series and to thank Nokomos for, Nokomos for their funding for this organization. The West Michigan Women's Studies Group is a consortium of faculty from all the area colleges and universities. It's a wonderful group of women that have brought a lot of diverse speakers to this, to this area. All of our speaker series is funded by Nokomis Foundation, which we heartily thank. And I would like all of the um, members of the West Michigan Women's Studies Council to please rise so we can acknowledge the work that they do in this community. Okay, a short thing on logistics. Um, please turn off your cell phones before the event starts. After Dr. Shiva speaks, uh, we will have a short question and answer period and the microphones are set up here for you to come up front and um, ask your questions. After the, the question and answer period, there will be a reception and book signing out that way. So let me then introduce Sonia Dalmia, um, an ec economics professor from Grand Valley, who is going to be introducing Dr. Shiva. Thank you, Judy. Namaskar, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the world-renowned environmental activist, physicist, feminist, philosopher, writer, and science policy advocate, Dr. Vandana Shiva. Identified by Time Magazine as an environmental hero of 2003, and as one of the five most powerful communicators of Asia by Asia Week, Dr. Shiva is known for combining intellectual research with grassroots activism to tackle environmental problems. Before becoming an activist, Dr. Shiva was one of India's leading physicists, a PhD in particle physics from the University of Western Ontario, Canada. She later shifted to interdisciplinary research in science, technology, and environmental policy at the Indian Institute of Science and the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore, India. Dr. Shiva has since contributed in fundamental ways to changing the practice and paradigms of agriculture and food. Her books, The Violence of Green Revolution and Monocultures of the Mind have become basic challenges to the dominant paradigm of non-sustainable agricultural development in India and throughout the world. In 1982, Dr. Shiva founded the Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Ecology. In close partnership with local communities and social movements, this institution has validated the ecological value of traditional farm farming techniques and has been instrumental in fighting many destructive development projects in India. Initiatives of this foundation are the organic farming program, Navdanya, or Nine Crops, the Bija Vidya Peet, or Seed University, and Diverse Women for Diversity. These initi initiatives reflect Dr. Shiva's understanding of the link between sustainability and democracy. And I quote, I believe Gandhi is the only person who knew about real democracy, not democracy as the right to go and buy what you want, but democracy as the responsibility to be accountable to everyone around you. Democracy begins with freedom from hunger, freedom from unemployment, freedom from fear, and freedom from hatred. To me, those are the real freedoms on the basis of which good human, human societies are based. Dr. Shiva's contributions to gender issues have also gained international recognition. Her book, Staying Alive, dramatically shifted the perception of third world women. In 1990, she wrote a report for the Food and Agriculture Organization on women and agriculture entitled, Most Farmers in India are Women. She founded the gender unit at the International Center for Mountain Development, Kathmandu, and she is recognized leader in the eco-feminist movement. Biotechnology, 
biodiversity, bioethics, and genetic engineering are other dimensions of Dr. Shiva's interna international campaigns for sustainability. She has assisted grassroots organizations of the Green Movement in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Ireland, Switzerland, and Austria with campaigns against genetic engineering. Besides her academic and research contributions, Dr. Shiva has also served as an advisor to governments in India and abroad, as well as non-governmental organizations such as the Women's Environment and Development Organization and Third World Network. She currently serves on the boards of the World Future Council, International Forum on Globalization, and Slow Food International. In her many avatars, as environmentalist, physicist, feminist, and philosopher, hers has been a powerful voice emanating from deep conviction and grounded in solid research. Her ability to combine intellectual study with grassroots activism in the fields of ecofeminism, biopiracy, and intellectual property rights has won her many international awards, including the Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, Order of the Golden Ark, the Earth Day International Award, and the Global 500 Award of United Nations. A prolific writer, she has written over 13 books and 300 papers in leading scientific and technical journals. Her latest book, Soil Not Oil, dares us to imagine a world where people matter more than profits. It brilliantly reveals what connects humanity's most urgent crisis, food insecurity, peak oil, and climate change, and why any attempt to solve one without addressing the others will get us nowhere. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Vandana Shiva. Thank you very much, especially to the Western Michigan Women's Studies Council um, for bringing me to Grand Rapids for my first visit and to this beautiful church. If only all big institutions of today would remember that big institutions never last forever in the dominant power they hold, and learn from this church to share a little more. We'd have a bit more of justice, we'd have a bit more of sustainability, and we definitely have a lot more of democracy. So I'm grateful also to the church for making this beautiful space available for ideas of freedom. As Sonia introduced, for me, freedom begins with freedom for nature, begins with freedom for human beings, equally for all, from fear and hunger and insecurity. The level of food insecurity we have today is absolutely unprecedented in human history. It's not the case that there wasn't hunger before. It's not the case that there wasn't famine off and on. But throughout history, these were localized events in space and time. You might have a very severe drought and some scarcity. You might have a war and not have enough food to eat. But that one billion people would be permanently condemned to hunger on a global scale. And another two billion people would suffer from another kind of malnutrition, the malnutrition caused by bad food that's giving us all the food-related diseases of obesity and diabetes and hypertension, um, that has never been an achievement of humanity. As long as the hand that fed us was a womanly hand, and it could be the womanly hand of Gaia, or it could be the womanly hand of your mother, Food never messed up the earth and our bodies in the way it is doing currently. 
We have a beautiful ancient text, the Tetre Upanishad, which says everything is food. Everything is something else's food. And it's so true. Yeah. I know in, in churches for a while, we were at the top of the pyramid, right? Human being on top, everything else below us, the empire of man over nature. Well, you get buried, the microorganisms have a field day on you. <laughs> and that humility that the food web brings is something that we can only understand when we remember that everything is food. Everything is food. And in nature, there's nothing like wasted food. The new studies coming out now, how the industrial food system, which has been created on grounds that it would reduce food waste, has actually led to massive amounts of waste. In nature, in Gaia's feeding, there's nothing like waste. Because every species waste is somebody else's food. You grow a crop, we were supposed to eat the grain, animals weren't. Their gut was never designed for grain eating. It was designed for grass eating. That's why they were called herbivores, not for nothing. Um, and now they're being fed grain and they're being put in competition with humans, whereas earlier there was a cooperative relationship where the grass and the straw went to the animals and the animals gave you not waste. I hate to call cow dung waste. We even have a beautiful festival. 17th of October is going to be Diwali, the festival of lights. And um, around that time, there's a day called the Gobardhan Puja. Go is the cow. Gobar is her gift. Dhan is the wealth. And what's worshipped on that day is the cow pat because that's where the recycling begins. I've always believed that the reason the cow was treated as sacred in India was because she is a, a keystone species for agroecosystems. You get the free energy, you get the free fertility, and you get a beautiful member of your family. When I wanted to leave university and um, start the Research Foundation in 1982. My uh, late mother was very generous and she said, don't ever hesitate. If that's what your passion is, follow it. And don't worry about a space. Here's the cow shed. You can use it. And uh, that's where I started this Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Ecology. Very, very grand name for an institute that began in a cow shed and is still in that cow shed, except that now we don't have the cows in with the books and the files. Yeah. In Gaia's world, in the women, womanly world, there's never been food scarcity of a permanent kind. In fact, the food ecology in a womanly world is an ecology of abundance. You always get more than you put into the system. I put one seed of amaranth. How many of you have seen an amaranth grain? It's so tiny. It's like the dot of a very fine pen. And I've never been able to complete the counting of the seeds that come out of that one seed of amaranth. It's an economy and an ecology of abundance. And living within those rules of abundance, you never run out. You never run out of seed. And there is a discipline in addition that says you don't destroy the seed. In my home region in the Himalaya, um, there was a war, we used to be ruled once upon a time by what is now Nepal, by the Gorkhas. And uh, there was a war. Uh, there was a famine that followed the war. 
Dead bodies were found in homes for lack of food, but the seed bins were full everywhere. Nobody touched the seed because the seed is the future. Seed is the past. Billions of years of evolutionary history, but billions of years of potential evolutionary gifts. And it, which is why it's a sacred duty to save seeds. And every culture has seen it as a sin to destroy seed for the future. Native peoples of this land, and I'm sure this land at some point was populated by, uh, by people who had looked after this land as a sacred land and had abundance from the diversity that the land provided. We were having a dinner conversation about the typical Michigan cuisine. Now, there would have been a typical Michigan cuisine once upon a time because it would have been based on the plants that grow in this area and the animals that are supported by the plants that grow in this area. And when the land was colonized, there were Indians like Chief Seattle. And of course, I love the word Indians for Native Americans. Just because poor Christopher Columbus was looking for spices of India and was trying a new route and landed on this continent, thought he had discovered India, and therefore the people of this land were Indians. I call it Columbus's big blunder. <laughs> There's, of course, a second intimate link to what we are seeing today as well as Columbus's blunder. The word patent actually is related to the kind of letter that Columbus carried. It was called the letter patent, which means the open letter. Because when the kings and queens of Europe were conspiring against each other, wanting to marry for expanding the empire, they used to sell, send sealed letters, closed letters, that only the parties who were in to see it could read. The open letters were the open letters for colonization to declare that the lands not ruled by white Christian princes were empty lands and belonged to white Christian rulers of Europe. And the, the connection was wonderful. It was God telling the Pope, telling the kings, telling Columbus on the basis of the bull of 1492. It's called the Papal Bull of 1492. And he carries this open letter and lands on the island and says, this, not only are you Indians, but this belongs to Europe. And today the patents continue in that same kind of blunder. I've called it, as you notice in my book, Biopiracy, I've called this the second coming of Columbus. Now, the first coming of Columbus was traumatic enough as the Europeans spread around the world to colonize, and they tried to turn land, the earth, into property, and its products into commodity, local cultures were absolutely resistant. And this is what an Indian chief said. You ask me to plow the ground, shall I take a knife and tear my mother's bosom? You ask me to cut grass and make hay and sell it and be rich like white men, but how dare I cut off my mother's hair? And, um, Robert Boyle, the famous scientist who was also the governor of the New England Company, he saw in this philosophy of the sacredness of nature, of the viewing of nature as a mother, an impediment. As he said, the veneration wherewith men are imbued for what they call nature, for what they call nature, as if she doesn't exist, for what they call nature, has been a discouraging impediment to the empire of man over inferior creatures of God. And this empire of man sentiment is how the new mechanical philosophy, which then became the industrial philosophy, was born very consciously. Um, the Royal Society, when it was formed in 1664, the secretary, Henry Oldenburg, said, 
Its main intention was to raise a masculine philosophy, whereby the mind of man may be ennobled with the knowledge of solid truths. What's in our head is liquid truths. And Glanville, for Glanville, another scientist, the masculine aim was science was to know the ways of captivating nature and making her serve our purpose, thereby achieving the empire of man over nature. And Bacon, who's called the father of modern science, of course, said it so clearly in his, um, in his book, The Masculine Birth of Time, that now onwards there would be knowledge for domination. And this knowledge, this objective knowledge would be gained through the rape of nature because she answers questions better when she's tortured. That's the early days of an imagination of thinking about the land that gives us food as if it was empty earth, terra nullius you might remember. Terra nullius both in terms of no people because if people weren't Europeans then they weren't people but also in terms of the land use. If you weren't making money out of the land, if you weren't make, producing commodities out of the land, you weren't being productive. Um, if, you, if you look at the literature of colonization, the legality, the, the legal philosophy of terra nullius, the empty land, they justify it in um, Australia by saying the Aboriginal people could never have had land title. They could never have you know, that the land couldn't be their land because they never grew apples. Because the proof of cultivation was growing apples in Europe. But that wasn't what the Aboriginal people cultivated. They never cultivated, but they had enough food. They had enough food as hunter-gatherers who by choice, not through inferiority, but by choice, stayed hunter-gatherers to be to live lightly on the earth, to just harvest. This economy of abundance is intimately linked by not taking more than your share because it's the taking more than your share that creates the scarcity. And it creates the scarcity in two ways. First, because it takes away other people's share. What's happening, for example, to corn and soya is such an obvious uh, illustration. We have more land under corn and soya now than any other crop. And yet we have food scarcity because Poor people are being forced to compete, first of all, with imprisoned and tortured animals who would, I'm sure, if they had the choice, say no thank you to that grain diet. And now they're being made to compete with cars for biofuel. So you just will never have enough food for people if food grains are first converted into a monoculture and then that monoculture is made a commodity that can be used to run a car one day and feed cattle the next day. Human beings, poor human beings come last in the hierarchy. The car is first, the imprisoned animal in a factory farm is second, and impoverished human beings come third. And among impoverished human beings, the women and children, of course, come last in the order of things, which is why hunger impact, hunger and malnutrition impact women and children most, even though it is women who started agriculture, even though women's agriculture has been a highly efficient and highly productive agriculture. I got an award some years ago from the Food and Agriculture Organization on my contributions to women in agriculture. And, um, and the theme of that year was Women Feed the World. What's forgotten usually is that most farmers are women. What's also forgotten usually is most providers of food and most processors of food are women. Um, 
Uh, I love it that, you know, when women work on farms, they don't work because they also work at the home. So to be a farmer, you mustn't do anything at home. Um, as when women cook in the kitchen, it's not work. It's not counted as work. And suddenly you get someone who puts on a white hat and puts on a white apron. It's a man, and suddenly he's a chef. <laughs> I'm vice president of the slow food movement. Every famous chef is famous because they learned good recipes from their grandmother. <laughs> there wouldn't be good cuisine if you take away the grandmothers. And food is, of course, a, is so interesting in our times because as long as women took care of food, it was unimportant. The work done around food was not work. And now that food is literally the place for the highest profit making, it's suddenly become a subject of capitalist patriarchy. I wouldn't even say subject, I should say object. Because it's been reduced to an object. First by destroying the very basis of food provisioning in the generosity of the earth, in the generosity of Gaia, in her soil, in her biodiversity, in her ability to convert the sunshine into everything we eat through that magical transformation of photosynthesis. In fact, if there had to be a pyramid, it should be the chlorophyll molecule on top because the chlorophyll molecule is giving us everything we need, including those who don't eat plants. The shifts that are taking place are radical. And they're shifts that are not just affecting women, they're shifts affecting all species on Earth, and they're shifts affecting all of humanity. And that's why when I talk about keeping food security in women's hands, I'm talking about keeping food security in women's hands because that's the only way we can shift the trajectory to a tra trajectory that brings us nourishment, that gives food to all, including all human species. The ability to live with biodiversity and produce food is a very deep ability and skill that women evolved over millennia of their expertise in food production. The monoculture of the mind, as I've described it, finds biodiversity totally intolerable. And not only does it find it intolerable, it's blind to it and has to destroy it. But women produce food through biodiversity. And for example, in a Nigerian home garden, 50 plants are a very, very common number. And in these home gardens, occupying only 2% of the household farmland, women of Nigeria produce half the food of Nigeria. On 2% land, 50% food. That for me is efficiency. Not using 10 times more energy in an industrial system to get out one-tenth the equivalent energy in calories, and then as if that loss of 90% was not good enough. You then take grain and feed it to animals and then step down another factor of 10. So you're literally making a factor of 100 disappear in our food system. And it doesn't disappear, it turns into the pollution in our rivers, into the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It's remaining in the ecosystem, but not as food, not as the useful energy, it's existing as the growth of entropy and waste. In Thailand, 230 species are in a home garden. So many of the ecosystems that uh, Navdanya, the movement I started, works with, 250, 150 very, very normal populations in women-run agricultural systems. Weeds, weeds are a new term, because there was nothing like a weed in traditional society. 
everything was useful. In fact, there's a very famous story of, a, uh, of one of, uh, of Buddha's uh, followers who was asked, you know, was collecting medicinal plants and had to learn about healing quality of plants and he came back repeatedly um, to say, and I found so many weeds. And it's only when he came back with the recognition there's no weed in nature, everything has a use, that then he was qualified to heal. Before that he had ignorance, he was too ignorant. Um, in West Bengal, 124 plants are used for food. Uncultivated plants are used for food. Most greens are uncultivated. Even this thing that's become extremely fashionable and high in high-end restaurants, arugula, the rocket salad, used to be a weed. And the peasants of Italy used to eat it. Of course, once you've got an agriculture based on that idea of man's empire over nature and the lesser species, as well as on the idea of commodification, that everything is a commodity to be sold, monocultures are an inevitable result. And in a monoculture, you have to declare war on biodiversity. You have to declare war on that which feeds us. So you've got first the creation of herbicides like Agent Orange. You've got um, the creation of herbicides like Basta. I really get dazed with the names. Um, if you look at the names of pesticides and herbicides, they tell you what it's about. Roundup, Machete, Lasso, Prowl, Pentagon, Squadron, Lightning, Assert, Avenge, Killer, that's supposed to be producing food? And of course, so much of the technology in agriculture today is war technologies deployed into agriculture after the wars ended. Pesticides, pesticides were designed to kill people. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring woke us up, up to that, that uh, companies that had got used to making money in the war couldn't give up the habit. Herbicides, Agent Orange, Vietnam, now 243D, sold as herbicides. And of course, they sold to us as, herb as liberators of women. Monsanto has ads throughout South India for Roundup. And um, it has a woman's hands chained by green leaves. And it says, liberate yourself, use Roundup. But of course, Roundup kills everything green that it comes with contact, in contact with. And a woman is not imprisoned when she's collecting some greens to feed her little goat if she's a landless woman, or herbs to heal her child who has diarrhea, or greens to cook for the evening meal. As long as you have greens, you cannot have anemia. You cannot have vitamin A deficiency. Most of the women of the third world today suffer from anemia. And that's partly because war was declared on the sources of iron-rich plants that nature gave us. And as if just the spring of these herbicides under these deadly names wasn't enough, then of course that brilliant mind of, uh, based on the rape of nature had to come up with genetically engineered herbicide resistant crops. So you can spray more herbicides, destroy the option of other people not having a herbicide in their garden. If, you, if you've seen what's happened to Argentina, Argentina today is a land covered with Roundup resistant soya. And the Roundup is sprayed from the air. If I'm a small holder, if I'm a woman with a small kitchen garden, I can't grow a crop because the Roundup will destroy my kitchen garden. And of course, now they're finding out huge damage to fetuses, lots and lots of problems with the use of Roundup. Even the government is having to wake up and is thinking about what to do. When I started my work questioning the tools 
of genetic engineering as a follower up of the tools of what was very, very mistakenly called the green revolution. I don't call it green because there was nothing green about it. The only reason it was named green in those days was because there was a red terror. Today, of course, the red terror is the best partnership of global capitalism. As you noticed, uh, President Obama did not meet the Dalai Lama because he has to go to China next month. Um, His Holiness is a problem for the friendship. And the friendship is only about debt and about consumption. Because I think 80%, you pick up anything in this country, it's made in China, anything. Um, So the Green Revolution, you know, a lot has been said about how it took India out of, um, out of famine. There was no famine in 65. We had a drought. A drought means a little less food. We wanted to import a little more wheat. And um, that's the time Norman Borlaug had been able to work out these new varieties of plants which could take lots and lots of fertilizer. And uh, the U.S. said, we won't send you wheat unless you change your farming to adopt these chemicals and these new seeds. And that's how the Green Revolution came to India, not by farmers making a choice. The growth in production of food, I have a whole book called The Violence of the Green Revolution. And I've shown in that that actually food did not increase. Rice and wheat increased. But increasing two commodities is not the same as increasing the food basket. In fact, it's about less nutrition because the pulses disappeared and in a vegetarian diet, without the pulses, you have no protein. The oil seeds disappeared and without adequate edible oils in your diet, you can't absorb vital nutrients. Good farming, the farming that evolved from women's expertise was about a balance of diversity providing all the nutrients you need. And the very name Navdanya that I've given to our movement actually came from a tribal farmer. There was nine crops in the field and I I was so excited. I said, oh my goodness, you've got nine crops. And uh, this tribal just turned around and said, yeah, Navdanya. And uh, I said, I know it means nine. And he explained to me how cosmology was related to ecology, was related to health. And diversity flew through every level. And of course then, onwards, I was going to talk about Navdanya and not about genetic resources, which anyway translated into any Indian language becomes atoms of a plant. And that's not how farmers see plants. They don't see it as atomized, just like the traditional societies don't see society as atomized, as Margaret Thatcher thought she could convince the world there is no society. There's only individuals who are supposed to go by. You remember? Well, we, I'm so thrilled. For the first time, a woman has got a Nobel Prize in economics, Eleanor Alstrom. And not only is it a woman who got the Nobel Prize, she got it for a womanly way of looking at the world, that we live in a commons. And through the commons comes democracy. As she said the moment she came to know about um, the award, and she immediately related it to the climate challenge. So a lot of people are waiting for an international agreement to solve global warming. There's an assumption that there are public officials who are geniuses and that the rest of us are not. It is important that there is an international agreement but we can be taking steps at family level, at community level, at civic and national level. There are many steps that can be taken that will not solve it on their own, but cumulatively will make a big difference. And I've always believed in this cumulative addition, that small steps of millions is what makes a powerful change. Tiny seeds and tiny plants in tiny farms is what feeds the world. Even today, there's a very, very important report out by what I would call the IPCC of agriculture, you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, 2,500 scientists. 400 scientists were asked to look at agriculture 
and what is the future of agriculture. And they did what the IPCC did, look at all the research. And they've said business as usual is not an option. The green revolution and genetic engineering cannot feed the world. It's the small holders, small scale farmers, and improvements in traditional farming systems made by indigenous communities on the basis of indigenous knowledge that has the highest level of performance. All our studies are showing that biodiverse organic systems have a much higher level of production in terms of food output, and I distinguish between output as a measurement of a diversity of the food basket and yield as a measurement of a single commodity production. But of course, if you look at a single commodity, you'll have more of that commodity in a monoculture. But if you look at food, you will have more food in a diverse ecological system. And that's why it's the small farms that women evolved, even today women are taking care of, where real food for real people is coming. The other stuff stopped being food a long time ago. It started to become some other thing, which our bodies weren't used to, which the food web of the planet wasn't used to, and definitely the mindset from which they came is an alien mindset for the food web of the planet. So when I was debating um, Monsanto during the Convention on Biological Diversity Days, when we were putting the international protocol on biosafety in place, I remember the Monsanto chief saying that in making herbicide-resistant crops, Roundup-resistant crops, we have a brilliant new technology that prevents the weeds, in essence biodiversity, from stealing the sunshine. Even the sunshine is privatized. It can only shine on a herbicide-resistant toxic soya bean. How dare it shine on the rest of life? Now, you know, the sun, interestingly, is becoming a, an interesting test case. I think some of you who are involved in, uh, in studies worthy of the patriarchal shift in the perception of the sun. Um, you know, climate change, everyone knows is about use of too much fossil fuels. It's also about use of synthetic fertilizers that come from fossil fuels and emit carbon dioxide in the processing and then emit nitrogen oxide in the application. Nitrogen oxide is 300 times more lethal for global warming than carbon dioxide. And then the third important gas is methane. And uh, you just have to pass a factory hog farm or a factory chicken farm, or as this new name they've got, calf, calf oats, what is it? Concentrated animal farm operations, calf oats. New vocabulary constantly, um, because they don't want to talk about animal prisons. You just have to go past, you can't breathe. Well, that's the poor methane being generated in huge amounts, and you've got slurry poisoning your bodies, your water bodies. In my book, Soil Not Oil, I've shown that if you take three components of the greenhouse gas contributions, directly from agriculture, partly from transport for long distance transport unnecessarily of foods you could be growing. Um, I don't know why our apples of Shimla have to be destroyed with subsidized apples from Washington. You go to an Indian market, you go to my neighborhood market, you got an apple and you got Washington. I can't buy it. You know, I just think of what it's doing to the atmosphere, but I think of what it's doing to our farmers. This mutually assured destruction of agricultural systems built into the globalized system is also a very major source of greenhouse gases. The Danish environment ministry had done a study that for every kilogram of food moving around the world, 10 kilograms of carbon dioxide is being put into the atmosphere. So you add it all together, it's 35 to 40 percent of the climate problem is a globalized industrialized system. And therefore, 40 percent of the climate solution is ecological agriculture and local food systems. I've had three delicious meals since I arrived last night. And they've all been in restaurants, local first. And it makes my heart happy. 
The food was also very good, better. Better than the non-local first. In the non-local first, you would probably get melamine in whatever they, you know, this chemical that was found in milk in China and the baby pet food uh, that had to have a recall. Um, so good food systems serve the earth. Good food systems serve the farmers. Good food systems serve our health. And the only place we can turn to in terms of building these good food systems is the knowledge women have retained over millennia. The current system, as I mentioned, has become a war against farmers. We've had, since 1997, since the seed monopolies entered India, we've had uh, 200 thousand suicides of Indian farmers because of indebtedness. Something we've never known. In the Green Revolution time, the experts would come from the United States and say, oh, Indian farmers are fatalists. They'll accept anything. Today, Indian farmers are giving up. They're giving up because they're so surprised. They did everything right. They worked as hard. And suddenly, they're in debt. They cannot pay back because seed has now become a monopoly. Genetically engineered seed is the entry into monopolies on seed through patents. And corporations like Monsanto think they have a right to extract as much in royalty payments as is possible. Um, I'm fighting a case. I've got five cases against Monsanto. Most of them we've won. But one case is on antitrust. With, with the government of a state of India. And Monsanto came into the court saying, we have every right to charge what we want, even if the farmers die, because we have intellectual property rights. What's the intellectual property right on a seed? A patent means an invention. A patent right means the ability to exclude anyone else from making, using, distributing the patented product or the patented process. A patent on seed means first a false claim that seeds came out of Monsanto's lab. Toxics came out of Monsanto's lab. Gene guns put those toxics into a plant, into a cell. They didn't make the plant, the plant makes itself. Seeds make themselves, life makes itself. So a patent is an extremely wrong application. The second place where a patent is wrong is most of the time it's taken on properties that have been evolved by farmers. And since seed keeping was a woman's activity, it means generations of women farmers. I fought three cases. One was the biopiracy of a natural pest control agent from a tree called the neem. And uh, when that terrible disaster took place in Bhopal, that's when I started the campaign, no more Bhopal's plant a neem, because the neem gives you natural pest control properties. And then Grace and the USDA patented it. We fought the case 11 years. Um, I don't think many of you know about it, but it's, it was three of us. When I started the campaign in India, but we had to, I wanted to fight in the US and Europe where this patent was. In the US, when we brought the challenge, the patent office said, so what's your commercial interest? We said, we have no commercial interest. We have a public interest. And they said, sorry, we don't entertain public interest. We just entertain competition between companies. But the Europeans have a public uh, ethics clause in their patent law, and we were able to bring the challenge. And I brought it with a woman who used to be the president of the International Organic Farming Movement, EFARM, Linda Bullard. And, um, the head of the Greens, the president of the Greens in Europe, Magda Albert. And three of us, just on the basis of friendship, fought one of the biggest chemical companies and the superpower of today. And after 11 years, we won. With no money, only love and trust. Lots of love and lots of trust. And no money in our pockets. Basmati, my valley is famous for this aromatic rice. Company in Texas claim to have invented it. We won that case too. And then Monsanto, 
wanted to patent a low gluten, gluten, gluten free wheat, an ancient Indian wheat with very low gluten. One reason there's so much gluten in the wheat is mechanized processing requires high gluten because it needs high elasticity. You keep throwing the flour to make mechanical bread and you just have to have more elasticity which the gluten provides, which is why so many people are getting gluten allergies, which is why Monsanto wanted a low gluten wheat for making biscuits. So they took a patent on the dough, on the wheat, on any product, and um, again we challenged it, and again we won. I'm now preparing for a campaign because this cannot be a legal fight because the patents now are for entire families of crops and for all traits under the sun because the companies can see that climate change is going to be their big source of profits. And they're claiming patents on what they call climate-ready crops and climate-ready genes. Now, you can't invent climate resilience in a gene because it's a complex factor. It's not in one gene. Many genes play together to create drought resilience, flood resilience, salt resilience. And we have saved these seeds in all our seed banks. Now you've got patents that are for cold stress and heat stress, drought and flood, all in the same patent and are for maize, wheat, rye, rice, barley, soya bean, peanut, cotton, rapeseed, canola, pepper, sunflower, uh, pl uh, potato, tobacco, eggplant, tomato, pea, alfalfa, alfa, coffee, cocoa, oil palm, coconut, perennial grass, all four large crops, one patent. Breeding is done on one family, one plant. This is really gambling as the financial banks gamble through derivatives and hedge funds and Mm, what was it when, when they put the sec securitization of mortgage debts or brilliant new instruments. You now have software programs to work through the plant material and do the genomic mapping. There's no breeding anymore. There's guesswork and this is how the promoters and Monsanto owns part of this company called Evergene and their software program collects vast amount of available genomic data to rapidly reach a reliable limited list of candidate key genes with high level of relevance to a target trait of choice. Allegorically, the athlete platform could be viewed as a machine that is able to choose 50 to 100 lottery tickets from amongst hundreds of thousands of tickets with a high likelihood that the winning ticket will be included among them. This is genetic casino. It's not about providing food. It's not about seed breeding, which makes it another imperative to keep food security and seed security in women's hands. Because we saw what the financial casino did to the world. This is more serious because it's about life on this planet. And a monopoly of these broad sweeping scales means no farmer anywhere will have the ability to grow the crops they want. We've already seen what the few patents on genetically engineered crops have done. Pushed Indian farmers to suicide, left widows. I do public hearings. I sit in places like this, like Gurdwaras. 2,500 widows giving witness to how their husbands drank pesticide to end their lives because they got into debt for BT cotton, always BT cotton. You've got the war against the farmers, you've got the war against the land, the biodiversity, you've got the war against the climate, against water, because this system is so thirsty. Organic systems pr produce clean water. Chemically farm system first use, at least in India, 10 times more water to produce the same amount of food. And then the water that's left is polluted goes into the oceans to create dead zones. Nitrogen oxide goes into the air to totally destabilize our climate. And of course, the war against our bodies. I think it's time for us to take back the seed, to take back the food, to take back our bodies. There's this brilliant book written by women, Our Bodies Ourselves. We need a new volume of it, or maybe volume two, Our Bodies Ourselves and the food that makes it.
because we are what we eat. We every cell, every part of, every bone, the blood, everything comes from what we've eaten, beginning, of course, with our mother's milk. Um, to imagine that our bodies don't have to take account of what's happening to the food chain means truncating our perception of how our health is shaped. We've got to take back the seed both because of the extermination of diversity as well as the extermination of renewability. For the first time, human hubris is trying to make seed that would not be seed. Seed is the source of life. Bija means that from which life arises on its own forever. That's the meaning of the word seed in Hindi and Sanskrit. Ja is life. B is that in which life arises on its own without anybody's help, without any roundup, without any patent. Now we've got the thinking about Terminator. It hasn't been allowed because we've got the Convention on Biological Diversity having banned it through huge movements worldwide. Women, the women's movement had this amazing slogan and marches, and I've been part of it, take back the night. We've got to take back more than the night. We've got to take back the world. And that does not mean that women are the only ones in the kitchen, but it does mean we improve the kitchen and bring the men to participate in being co-creators with nature to bring back food to its integrity, its authenticity, and its freedom to give us nourishment rather than disease, to give us health rather than illnesses, and to also renew the body of the earth because 70% of the degradation of land, 70% of the degradation of water, and probably 70% of the disappearance of species is coming from insane, warlike, masculinized, greed-based systems of pro producing food, which are not producing food anymore, as I said. It has become non-food. Just as seed is becoming non-seed, food is becoming non-food. And we cannot afford to allow this to carry on. I, my personal life is dedicated to these issues of seed saving, organic farming, partly because for me, a world where five companies manipulate the seed, another five manipulate the food chain and call themselves food processors and give us high fructose corn syrup, and another five trade in food in such a way that farmers get destroyed worldwide that is nothing less than a global totalitarian rule over our food system. It is a food dictatorship. And what we have to build in every one of our homes, in every one of our kitchens, in every one of our meals is a food freedom. I believe this freedom will begin with the seed, will become, begin with our small gardens, will begin, begin with the small steps that Dr. Ulstrom addressed, that it's the small steps accumulate into big transformation. And I'm sure you will all be part of it. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Shiva? Um, can you hear me? Not really. Okay. Um, my, my question is, um, in your books, you do, and today, you mentioned cosmology and its connection to ecology and its connection to health. But I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your own personal spiritual conviction and how that translates into the work that you've done. 
my own personal spiritual conviction and how that has translated into the work that you've done. Well, you know, when you grow up in a culture or civilization like India, um, you can't avoid a spiritual tradition. Um, and as you know, in most of the Indian philosophies you know, and so many of the religions have taken birth in, in Asia, most of them have actually taken, major religions have taken birth in Asia, um, and at least the three that are based on nonviolence, on doing no harm, Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism, uh, begin with the idea that creation is what's sacred, and creation creates itself. That, uh, you, you know, you, you don't have a bearded man up in the sky somewhere, creating for six days and then asking us all to sleep on the seventh. Uh, but that every blade of grass, every microorganism in the soil, every river is sacred. And I've very much grown up with that. And of course, it has so happened that dedicating my life to ecology, uh, all those traditions have inspired me hugely. I also grew up in a very, very deeply spiritual family. Um, and the wonderful thing in countries like India is the more spiritual you are, the more rebellious you are against institutionalized religion that would separate you from other religions. Um, so, you know, India is also the home of the Sufi tradition, which is common to both Hindus and Muslims. And we have the most famous Sufi shrines like Ajmer Sharif uh, or Nizamuddin Chishti. Um, so I'm very much, my, you know, my, my deep philosophy is of a sacred nature that nature is sacred and every species is sacred and every species has its intrinsic worth, its integrity, and um, its right to live on its own terms. When I had to give a talk on the Dalai Lama's 60th birthday, uh, it's interesting, of course, I talked on patterns because I thought he must know about this, you know, because where would he hear about patterns and genetic engineering? And he wrote this one beautiful line, every being has a right to happiness, and no species has a right to take it away. And well, that's how I think about the world. Good evening, Dr. Shiva. Uh, thank you for having this conversation with us today. Uh, it's an honor to have you here. Um, my question is the following. In the introduction, um, it was mentioned some of your contributions to sustainability. And, um, and it's certainly that kind of discourse is, very, is more popular at the moment than it has been before. I'm wondering if, if you would care to comment on what you see as the successes as well as the limitations of sustainability as an environmental goal and, and as a conservation goal. Thank you. Well, you know, the interesting thing is one of the issues I fought was Monsanto trying to privatize water. Most people don't know that they'd also tried that. And this was part of their strategic sustainability plan. Someone in Monsanto leaked it to me in time. And they said in that, there's increasing water scarcity, there's increasing pollution of water, therefore there's a wonderful market out there, and that's sustainability, because for them sustainability was profits. That's why the Terminator seed is sustainable profits, because for every year, every season, you can sell seeds to the farmer at super profits. So, you know, you always have to come qualify sustainability of what? Because you can have sustainability of the wrong thing. The reason I'm very critical of the Kyoto Protocol is its outcome was the ability of polluters to trade in pollution. And in effect, the polluters got paid. It wasn't a sustainable solution. If looked at from the carbon cycle, we cannot afford to have false market measures and after September we shouldn't have to remind people that the market can lie. Its value can lie. And therefore, to put the entire discussion of carbon on the carbon trading system rather than the carbon cycle in the real world, which is totally measurable at the scientific level, I think that's the failure of the narrow sustainability discourse. And I hope by the time we come to Copenhagen, 
the movement that thinks at a deeper level and connects at a deeper level is able to shape an agenda for authentic sustainability. You mentioned earlier a lot about hunter-gatherer societies and how a lot of the problems we have now didn't exist in those societies. And so I'm wondering, in your vision of the future, how hunter-gatherer societies play into that, if it's sort of a going back to that, or how that incorporates into a solution for the future? Well, I think we need pluralism. And we now need pluralism of all ecological practices. Pastoralism, hunter-gatherers were highly sustainable. If they were made unsustainable, it's because the land that they had access to was shrunk. For example, shifting cultivation is a highly sustainable system of farming. But if in your seven-year cycle, you don't cover different grounds and have to come back too frequently to the same patch and chop the forest, the forest can never regrow to its diversity. The same goes for pastoralism. Um, the Amazonian tribes are hunter-gatherers, even today. Their forests are being destroyed and their lifestyle is being destroyed in order to grow the soya bean that feeds the cattle that then give us the diseases that we are getting, partly because grain makes the, you know, stomach, especially, you know, makes the stomach more acidic. Animals aren't used to it. And, and the new strains of disease that are emerging are, are therefore mutant versions. If we left the Amazon alone, and instead of abandoned farms in the United States and paying for set-asides in Europe and the US, and destroying the farms in places like India, we grew food where it can, hunter-gatherers would have space to be hunter-gatherers. And I really see the future as two human activities, gathering and gardening. I think if we can imagine a world of gatherers and gardeners and protect the diversity that allows that to happen, we'll get overcome hunger, we'll of course solve climate change, and we will have just more peace on this planet. very much for coming to Grand Rapids. Um, my question is about patents. My understanding is that patents are um, intended to incentivize innovation. So I'm wondering if you think innovation isn't necessary in the food production um, industry, or if you think women will be able to innovate without having that self-interest. Well, women have innovated constantly without having patent regimes, because women have lived and societies have lived in cultures of sharing and giving. When you live in a culture of giving, you don't have ideas of appropriation. Um, all the seed diversity in the world, you know, India used to have 200,000 rice varieties. In Navdanya, we have saved 3,000 rice varieties. The varieties are named by their properties, not by the farmer who made the selection. No farmer will ever say, I selected this, therefore it is mine, and you can't have it, you pay me a royalty. So innovation, innovation will happen as long as societies evolve and nature evolves. You can't stop it. The day it stops, you're going to have death. If farmers would not have been able to evolve seeds for changing climates, and we've had changing climates of very different kinds, we wouldn't have had crops, we wouldn't have had hum human species continuing into the future. Um, as I said, the, a patent is a totally inappropriate intellectual property right for the living world because life is not an invention. It's as simple as that. All that the companies do is introduce a gene into a plant, into a cell which grows into a plant. Um, I could have brought this tool from India. If it was folding, it would even have been easy to carry it in the plane. And can you imagine if I brought this stool, put it here, and at the end of it said to the church, I made this church, I own it, now you pay me a rent each time you hold a talk out here, they'd laugh at me. It's a crazy Indian. 
But that's exactly what Monsanto's doing. They put a gene, which is the equivalent of a little stool, into a life form with millions of genes, and say they've made all those other genes, have made the plant, and therefore own all future generations of that plant, no matter how it, they came to exist. And that's why we have this other problem with, this, uh, with patents in, uh, in seeds. When a company contaminates, if, if a Roundup resistant gene moves into a, a crop of an organic grower, then the organic grower is sued because the existence of a gene anywhere, no matter how, by wind, by pollination, is now treated as intellectual property theft. 1,500 farmers in this country, Percy Smizer in the US, I personally know farmers, in, in Europe, who've been sued after the companies contaminated their crop. And I think this is perverse. So I would basically, again, celebrate Alstrom's Nobel Prize and celebrate seed and biodiversity as our living commons. We'll all be better off for it, not poorer for it. Monsanto's stocks will fall, but they're falling anyway. And I'm waiting for them to fall long enough so they become like an Enron and disappear from our lives. This might seem silly, but if you have to choose one or the other, would you choose locally or organic? There's never one or the other. I did my PhD in quantum theory. Non-Boolean logic. <laughs> it's never an either or, it's always an and. But, well, Local and organic is the best option. Well, yeah. We don't have to pit ourselves against each other. It's a bit like, you know, when they fed those cows, diseased cattle, mm -hmm. with the mad cow diet, and the poor cows became mad, and then the humans who ate the burgers became, had spongy form. Uh, eventually they found that w uh, what this was about was a distorted protein, not a new infection. It was a prion, you know, a distorted protein that became a self-infective agent. And I think in the movements, we often prionize ourselves. We constantly put more energy being purists and fighting each other than dealing with the serious and big issues out there. And as we take small steps towards local, there will also be small steps towards organic. As we take small steps towards organic, organic farmers and organic eaters will have to make more direct links to create more local markets. So it's not an either or, it's both, and as much as possible, in whichever step is easier to make in your context. Thank you uh, very much again for your thoughts and for your time this evening. Um, I'm very proud to say that I'm a sustainable business student at Aquinas College here in Grand Rapids. And uh, the nucleus of our program is in biomimetics. Um, biomimics like Jane Benyus and Wes Jackson of the Land Institute um, echo your sentiments regarding crop diversity. Um, they suggest perennial polyculturing as an alternative to, you know, annual crop monocultures here as part of the, you know, agricultural industrial complex. Um, are you familiar with their work? And if so, what impediments in your opinion prevent perennial polyculturing from achieving scale? Um. What, what has destroyed more perennials in polycultures and polycultures in general is centralized systems which must by the very nature become uniform systems because if you want to trade in soya bean, you want soya bean everywhere. And if you want to trade in soya bean, you'll make sure all other crops are displaced to grow more soya bean, which is why giant corporations controlling the trading system then create the pressure to have monocultures and also create the pressure to have annuals because if you look at the issue of seed sale, where on earth would Monsanto make profits with perennials? You grow a seed once and it grows forever. So they need annuals. The seed monopolies need annuals. The grain monopolies need monocultures. Chemicals also need monocultures. Because to the extent that you work with the food web, 
you put back all the nutrients the soil needs, the soil decides which crop, and the crops decide which nutrients it'll pick up. It's through their inner intelligence and their self-organization and their own complexity. But when you think fertility is what you apply from outside, then you can only put the fertilizers for the wheat plant because the chickpea will do very badly with it. I watch scientists in India trying to recreate polycultures through chemical farming and they can't get it right. Either one crop does well or the other crop does well. Both never do well from external inputs. So you need ecological farming for poly polycultures. You need decentralized distribution systems for polycultures, which is where the local comes into the picture. And you definitely need an end to patterns because if there are no patterns, there'll be no incentive to force every farmer to grow annual crops every year and the same annual crop everywhere in the world. Last question for the evening. Um, I was wondering if uh, masculine philosophies are necessarily contradictory to healthy, womanly. Um, You'll have to speak a little louder. Uh, You're becoming too womanly. <laughs> okay. Louder. Uh, are, are masculine philosophies necessarily contradictory to healthy, womanly food providing uh, philosophies and activities? And how can men assist in um, womanly food cultivation and providing without yeah. contradicting and bullying systems? Yeah. Well, when I referred to masculine philosophies and I read those quotations, it isn't the way men think. It's the way a particular break in uh, cultivating our mental framework, made certain thinking dominant, made certain thinking defined as masculine, and wiped out the qualities that were then defined as womanly. For example, the idea of quality, the idea of relationships and interconnectedness, those all disappeared with the mechanical philosophy. It was all about measurement, and it was all about a false objectivity, and it was all about reductionism, fragmentation, and separation. So it's not about how men think because there is no difference in the way men can think and the way women can think. But this is cultivated, and of course, through the cultivation, then more men went through that kind of training. The movement diverse for women for diversity came out of those of us who were working on the Convention on Biological Diversity and questioning both patents and genetic engineering and we sat, suddenly realized we were all women. Many of us were men scientists, and we realized the reason we could do this questioning is we hadn't been inside the club long enough. Yeah? So how can men join the emergent thinking for diversity, for ecological sustainability, for inclusion, for nonviolence? First and foremost, you know, I always get so impressed by Gandhi. He used to say a daily prayer. He said, make me more womanly. He was a man wanting to be more womanly in terms of a deeper cultivation of nonviolence. And as I mentioned at the end of my talk, women's, keeping food security in women's hands just means the skills of seed saving, the skills of good food production, that those need to spread. And men need to go into the kitchen. The men need to be in the uh, seed <coughs> saving gardens. Men need to be in school gardens. <coughs> the men definitely need to be in eco-feminist courses at university. And uh, you know, every time I've done an eco-feminist workshop, we've had lots of men and some of my dearest friends who think like me, I call, they are eco-feminists, they call themselves eco-feminists. To be an eco-feminist doesn't mean you've got to be a woman. It's a way of looking at the world and acting in it. So welcome to the eco-feminist movement. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. Please join us for the reception. Thank you again. <laughs>